Well, hey guys, it's Dr. Drake 63 here. I want to thank you for joining me today. The topic of today's video is going to be talking about the battle rifle, starting uh, with the first successful military semi-auto version, which is the M1 Garand. Just an, an overall beast of a firearm in terms of size, overall weight, everything else. But this guy right here, this was the stuff starting in about 1939. It started seeing a lot of uh, deployment, obviously, in World War II. And this was the main battle rifle for the United States Army starting uh, in that time frame going up through the mid-50s. Um, not going to talk a bunch about the specifics of each of these rifles. I've got a few examples. I'm not just going to focus on the United States, but uh, going to look at NATO versus Warsaw Pact for the most part. But uh, this firearm right here in its time was uh, extremely innovative in that you had an eight round capacity, could go with a very quick rapid fire of a very heavy 30 odd six round. Uh, and it was very effective, especially against forces that were dealing with bolt action rifles. You could just fire this and reload it so much quicker. So the starting point is the M1 Grand. We're going to go all the way through present day, and uh, I'm going to dispel what I believe are some very common myths that are out there about firearms in this category. Uh, talk about reasons why the U.S. went with some of the, the designs that they did. And in addition to that, like I said, look at some of the Warsaw Pact stuff starting in the early 40s going through today philosophies of use, things of that nature. So I hope you will enjoy this video. Stay tuned. So this is the classic German MP40. And even though it's not a battle rifle, it inspired the battle rifles to come. We'll get into that in a second. But every time you see a movie that shows Germans doing battle, it's as if every guy is carrying one of these. And that certainly wasn't the case. The Germans did develop a very effective semi-automatic rifle of higher caliber in the Guerrero 43. The Soviets also had a very capable rifle of the semi-automatic nature in the SVT-40. However, mostly you see them running around with their PPSHs like this one in 762 Tokarov. This unfortunately also had a highly undependable magazine. Now, when you think about the Soviet forces during World War II. A lot of the time you're going to spend thinking about the Mosin Nagant, uh, the PPSH. Here I've got uh, another example. This is the PPS 43, and this was a very lightweight and compact submachine gun that was developed in 762 Torkorov. And why was that? The main reason that something like this was so handy was because of the nature of the warfare that the Soviets saw as they moved westward in World War II after the turning point in Stalingrad. They had to take a lot of cities, a lot of cities like Warsaw, a lot of cities like Danzig, and then of course Berlin. So you're talking about some pretty short distances, so all of a sudden these big battle rifles with uh, heavy calibers like 7.62x54 and so forth weren't as handy getting in and out of buildings, street to street, house to house, things of that nature. It's something like this, where the effective range is, is plenty acceptable for that type of warfare. The Germans went with the MP38s and later the MP40s, and that was the way they went about business. That is until they developed the STG-44. Now, I know I told you that this was going to be about battle rifles, and right about now some of you are saying, well, this is about other things, submachine guns. What are you doing? Well, there's an important turning point in all of this, and here it is. It's the SDG-44, which was a rifle that the Germans brought in about 1943, and as you can see on the bottom, it fires what is called an intermediate size cartridge. And this is something that uh, became widely adopted in militaries across the world going forward. And here's the most famous example of that. This happens to be a uh, Norinco AKM. Uh, it's in 7.62x39. Uh, so, yeah, Chinese version, but you get the drift. It's an AK-47-ish. 
And this became the new standard of what the Russians were going to do. They quit making the submachine guns uh, in 1946 and started putting all their eggs into this basket. And that is the idea of having a firearm that is uh, easy to work, easy to maintain, easy to fire, doesn't take a lot of instruction, shoots a cartridge which is effective well out past 400 yards, and uh, you can fire it on full auto. So that was the change. Now a lot of people will say, well, this wasn't developed by Mikhail Kalashnikov. This is a ripoff of the STG-44. That's an argument for a different day. My opinion is, yes, it is heavily inspired by the STG-44. But this became kind of the new standard. And while the Russians were doing this, the U.S. was going to the M14, which was basically just a rework of the M1A1. It fired a 308 cartridge. It could go on full auto, but as mentioned previously, not very controllable. So while all this was going on, pretty much the rest of the world, with the exception of the Warsaw Pact, was getting involved with this guy right here, the FNFAL, which is a 7.62x51 semi and fully automatic rifle designed by the folks at FN. Yes, the same folks that helped develop the Browning High Power. Now, this took a box magazine, held 20 rounds like the M14, and um, the, the biggest difference was the fact that this was more controllable in full auto. Had a very long sight radius, which obviously helped in terms of uh, ability to acquire targets. Again, this is before red dots and all those things we rely on today. This one has uh, a synthetic handguard in stock. The earlier versions were wood. But uh, these were really cool rifles, and a lot of people think that the U.S. should have adopted this instead of going to, say, for example, the M16. Uh, just a very cool-looking piece of, uh, of firearm history, and uh, these were widely used. One of the things that was instrumental in moving on to the next rifle in the U.S. arsenal was basically the fact that they were looking at how much ammo someone could carry, and they coupled with that the distance, average distance, that firefights were taking place. No longer considered to be four and 600 yards, more so to be in the 200 yardish area. So you could carry a whole lot of 5.56 five, ammo, also known as the Remington 223. Uh, you could carry a whole lot more of that than you could 308. So we'd gone from the 30 odd six to the 308 to the 5.56. Now I want to dispel a rumor that's out there about why they developed the 5.56 because it's often been reported that they wanted ammo that would maim rather than kill their opponent, thereby tying up more enemy troops and causing more enemy, enemy troops to be involved in uh, assisting a wounded person than somebody that had been completely taken out with a heavier round. It's completely false, guys. I know it's often been repeated, and even in some you know web links that you can find. But the truth of the matter is, uh, the opponents the U.S. was preparing to face, Warsaw Pact, those folks didn't have the same dedication to removing their injured and recovering their injured and their dead that the United States has always been so good about. It's important to remember that. Same case goes for the Vietnam era wars. So that's really just a misnomer that's out there. The reason that they went to the smaller caliber, as I said, less distance required in terms of effective range means you can use a smaller caliber, which means you can carry anywhere from two to three times as much ammo into the field with you. And in a firefight, that's what's important. Now the M16 has seen quite a few changes since its inception. The early versions didn't have this forward assist on it. They didn't have chrome barrels. And uh, you had a situation there where uh, uh, they weren't widely adopted in terms of philosophically by the Army. This firearm was kind of forced upon them by Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, and the so-called whiz kids on his team. They were all about doing things that were about mass production, interchangeable parts, how much does it cost to manufacture something, things of that nature. The Army never wanted this rifle. 
and uh, it, a lot of documentation out there about different trials and things done where the Army actually went out of its way to sabotage the function of these. Well, they got smart. They realized they needed ball versus stick ammo. They realized that they need stuff like a forward assist and a chrome line barrel. And prior to previous uh, notions, this is a rifle that needs to be cleaned, just like any other rifle. And over the years, this has evolved from this 20 inch barrel version with the carry handle sight to something like this M4 configuration that has rails and places for attachments, for optics, lasers, things of that nature. And uh, to today's versions, which are even shorter yet. Now this is a 16 inch barrel to make it a legal carbine, uh, actually a military use, a lot of them are 11 inch barrels. So because of that, you needed to do things like speed up the barrel twist rate to a one and seven. Uh, you needed to get some heavier ammo and some things like that. Uh, from a penetration standpoint, they developed the green tip. So there's a lot of different versions of this same exact rifle, but I could interchange many of the parts, most of the parts from this rifle into this rifle and vice versa. There still exists a need for a, a true battle rifle, something that shoots a full-size caliber. Here's an FN SCAR that's chambered in 7.62x51. A lot of folks like these rifles just because of the heavier caliber. And there's still a lot of adaptations on the 5.56 and other platforms like this SIG. There's no telling what the future is going to bring in terms of the military battle rifle, the submachine gun, and various tools like that that are used by militaries. But what is clear is that thinking that went into place back at the turn of the last century, that you needed a powerful gun with a long sight radius, because they weren't using a lot of optics or scopes back then, and it needed to be able to take out uh, an enemy combatant at six or seven or 800 yards. Back in those days, they also thought trench warfare made a lot of sense. I also know from the standpoint of the development, I, I belong to a lot of groups that are military collectibles, M1 Grand groups, things like that. And you're going to find your share of people that say, hey, you should stop with the M1. You don't need anything else. It's the best battle rifle ever uh, invented. I will say this, for its time, it was the most innovative ever invented. But to pretend that you didn't have a continuity of development that went all the way through modern M4 type platforms, modern AKs, things of that nature, to pretend that that does not exist and that you should have stopped back with a 1939 design, well, that's about as outdated as suggesting that uh, a 1911 with a seven round capacity and ball ammo is as far as you need to go with handguns. I think most of us will agree that's not the case. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this brief little overview today. Uh, it certainly could have been hours going into each of these different firearms, how they were used, the plus, the minus, and all of that kind of thing. But I think it's safe to say uh, there's been a lot of advancement in the last hundred years. There's no question about it. How much more is there? Probably not a lot. Um, a lot of the things that uh, existed as battlefield essentials a hundred years ago with air power, with drones, with much more accurate artillery, with satellites, you name it, military intelligence. The thought of uh, winning wars with a rifle from uh, 500 yards away just really is, is not as prevalent as it used to be in old military doctrine. Anyway, I appreciate you watching today. This is DR Drake 63 saying, carry on guys. I also want to thank my good friends at Max Guns and Ammo in Savage, Minnesota for loaning us a couple of the rifles that were used in the making of this video. Check Max out.